Welcome to Think NP Backstage Pass. Today we have with us Jennifer Lynn Robinson, CEO and founder of Purposeful Networking. And let me just read her bio here because she is into all sorts of things that I think are important to know as somebody who is a consultant, freelancer, or vendor to a nonprofit. So her goal is to help people be more comfortable and confident with their networking skills. And boy, if that isn't something that all of us could use. She conducts workshops, seminars, and speaking engagements for workplaces, business associations, nonprofits, and conferences. Jennifer also does one and one consulting to help individuals maximize relationships and sales through comprehensive and personalized networking plans. And she holds, and I love this, and we were talking a little bit before we started here, she holds certifications in event planning, nonprofit management, and conflict resolution. And I think that's a great <laughs> combination. Uh, she has her Bachelor's of Arts from uh, Haverford College and a law degree from uh, Villanova University. Uh, so she's part of Villanova Nation for <laughs> anybody. Yes. Um, she sits on the uh, executive uh, alumni board of Haverford College and the board of advisors of Femfessionals. Uh, Jennifer's quite a writer, and you'll see her work in Huffington Post, uh, Fem and Fortune, Business News Daily, About Her, CEO Blog Nation, Greater Philadelphia Business Magazine, and the Mainline Times and Philadelphia Magazine. And she's also contributing author of The Happy Law Practice, which reached number one on Amazon in 2014. Uh, she's uh, a veteran radio person uh, and has been a guest on several uh, radio shows and hosts a local TV program called Mainline Connect. Uh, she was honored in 2016 as uh, Woman of the Year for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society uh, Eastern Pennsylvania chapter and has been named a person on the move in 2015 and 2016. Uh, her business was named Best innovative business on the main line by the mainline media news and that was in 2016 and she was a finalist for the best entrepreneur of Montgomery County Pennsylvania in 2014 and 2015 so that is quite a list of accomplishments <laughs> and uh, and you live in suburban Philadelphia so yes. you've really taken advantage of the local market and it looks like you're you're really expanding out outside of that too Doing my best every day <laughs> that's great well and that's uh, you know and, and given what you focus on I think that's uh, that's really important I mean you know yes. that you can you know walk that uh, uh, that oh talk. you have to yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. so um, why don't we jump right in and uh, Jennifer tell me uh, what kind of consulting do you do what is purposeful networking so, you know, when I started my business, I realized that you could be out and about every day, you know, which I was, you know, mm -hmm. many events, meeting people one on one, going to events at night, all times of day. And when do you actually focus on doing your work, doing the marketing for your business, you know, all of that good stuff. Yeah, um, exactly. So I kind of made the mistakes of a typical new business owner and I decided I would try to start helping people strategize to do it better, more mm. efficiently, okay. um, you know, more targeted to their market, uh, that sort of thing. So, you know, the consulting basically is helping anyone from somebody that works from a nonprofit to someone in transition, an executive, um, you know, entrepreneur, small business entrepreneur, pretty much somebody that needs help with focusing their networking and marketing efforts in a more targeted way. Um, what are what are they doing now? What should they be doing that might be better? Who are their competitors? What's their target market? Um, you know, what initiatives can they do to gain more visibility mm. for themselves uh, without spending a whole bunch of money to do it? Right. Um, how can they maximize their opportunities so that they're not burned out and out every day joining every organization? All the things that I did. Right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Learn yeah. from Jennifer's mistakes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no, yep. this is really cool because uh, it really is important that we all learn from each other that way and it sounds like you had some valuable experience you're able to bring to others in this realm so that they can be more effective more quickly I think so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, how did you get started in this I mean you, uh, you obviously you have a law degree here right. and it, it sounds like uh, I mean was big firms not the thing for you how did that work I never worked for big firms I worked in 
in-house for insurance companies. So oh, okay. um, I worked for uh, Cigna, Allstate, and um, AAA, mm -hmm. Mid-Atlantic for eight years before I left practicing. And essentially I was doing civil litigation trial work. Um, okay. So hearings, you know, depositions, arbitrations, and bench and jury trials, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I had a near-death accident in 2008, oh and um, that definitely changed the course of my life um, yeah. in many ways, as it would, you know, when people yeah. go through things like that. So, well, we're grateful um, to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, I mean, after that, um, I really felt... Uh, there were many things I wanted to change about my life. It kind of gives mm -hmm. you a new perspective. You feel like you have a second chance. So sure. um, at the time, unfortunately, um, as a result of the accident, in addition to everything else I had going on, I had a traumatic brain injury. Mm. And sure. that was probably the toughest part. Even though I had very serious physical injuries, that was the toughest part to, um, you know, as far as the way it affected my life. Sure. And I couldn't go to court anymore. So that mm. was kind of what drew me to be a lawyer. I mean, I won't even say kind of. That's the only reason I went to law school was to be in court, be in front of people, you know, do hearings, do right. trials. That right. was what I loved about the law profession. Once I couldn't do that anymore, um, it really had no appeal for me, to be okay. honest. Oh, so, you know, my company was fantastic to me. I had a great boss. It was mm -hmm. a small office. We were a family. Um, they put me in a desk job, you know, because that's what I could do at the time. And yeah. it made me, uh, you know, increasingly more depressed, frankly, mm. because I was going through a lot of post-traumatic stress and depression and all yeah, that. Right. So essentially, I ended up giving it up um, with no okay. game plan, no plan. Wow, <laughs> you just took the leap. <laughs> um, I just, you know, I just it was like, this is not working out. You know, yeah. I need to concentrate on my recovery and my rehab, mm -hmm. and I had a long way to go. And, um, you know, I left with no plan. And uh, essentially, I decided maybe within about six months that I was going to open a business that was mainly focusing on nonprofits and businesses, okay. putting them together and helping them as an outside consultant. Sure. Um, and the reason I did that is because I've always been interested in helping community you know, service and nonprofits mm -hmm. from the time I was in grade school. So okay. it's something I've always been involved with. When I worked for all the companies that I mentioned, I helped out with all their volunteer initiatives. Mm. At AAA, I was the Philadelphia representative planning all our corporate you know, giving activities and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so it was something I always gravitated towards. Um, and I really saw that there was a need, you know, that wasn't being represented by uh, nonprofits that were able to have full-time staff to deal with those sorts of things. Yeah. So I thought yeah. that's something I could help out with. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so uh, when you, uh, I mean, you, you talked about your background, you know, and how you got into this. So how did you grab your first couple clients? How did yeah. that work out? So really, it was through networking, um, okay. you know, and, and I can't speak enough to the value of networking. Obviously, it's what yeah. I do, so I'm biased, but... Well, and um, that's one of yeah. the w ways we met. I mean, <laughs> right. I forget exactly how we connected, but it was a few years ago, and... Yeah. Suddenly Jennifer's in front of me here, and, yeah. and you know we were. Uh, and I remember it was a Starbucks, I think, uh, someplace nearby here. Yeah, so, it was. Yeah. yeah, and then I think we also might have met at um, the NCN nonprofit consultant mm -hmm. network. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, really just getting out every day, getting my name out there, mm -hmm. um, talking to some of the connections in the nonprofit world that I had, and just letting people know what I offered, okay. um, and a couple people just taking a chance on me at the beginning, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I think um, one thing that's important to mention is. You know, I did end up transitioning the business within the first year, which was a little bit controversial because right. I had gone through, um, you know, the lawyers and the trademark and the website and everything that I was going to focus on. Mm -hmm. And I realized there was such a niche, um, you know, because a couple people really I didn't realize that I shouldn't take credit. A couple people around me um, said, you know, you're really good at this networking stuff. This is what you should be focusing on. Oh, and and I said, you know, what do you mean? Um, you know, what am I doing exactly? And how would I get paid for it? Like I, it, I couldn't yeah. really wrap my head yeah. around it. Well, no, this is really yeah. good because one of the things that I think it's important to do is kind of follow your market and listen right. to what other people are telling you because a lot of times folks will sh point out to you, show you what you don't see yourself. And I didn't see it. And, and yeah. so that's that's huge. This is really good. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when I started the business, putting the nonprofits and businesses together, I have to say, even though I was getting steady business, it was mm -hmm. not going the direction I had hoped. Um, okay. I was much more 
it seemed like I was being hired more to help plan events and focus say, on yeah, things like that, that. That's right. Yeah. It, it did seem more of an event management right. kind of angle. And I can do that, but mm -hmm. it's really not what I wanted to be doing. Yeah. So, you know, I was kind of immediately disappointed with the course of how things were going. And I'm sure I probably could have, mm -hmm. you know, changed that course. But, you know, like I said, I ended up focusing on this networking niche. And what was interesting is um, you mentioned I sit on the board of Femme Fessional. So it's mm -hmm. a women's, um, essentially an entrepreneur organization, but there certainly are women that are involved in it that are in the course corporate or nonprofit world as well, but overwhelmingly sure. entrepreneurs. And they had a mastermind and I basically brought the idea there. Now, and, I'm sorry um, if I can pause sure. this for a second, because yeah. a lot of the audience may not know what's a mastermind. So essentially it was a round table group of mm -hmm. women that wanted to work on their businesses and okay. you kind of, it's almost like, I think she said at the beginning, it was like a Las Vegas concept in that what happens in this room stays in this room. Right. Yeah. So, exactly. you know, we talk about our challenges, what's going right and what's not going right with our businesses mm. and try to give each other advice okay. and, you know, not, not, uh, you know, go public with what the challenges were with our businesses, that sure. sort of thing. Okay. So cool. there was a safe place. Yeah, um, right. So I kind of, you know, talked to them in a, sh in a longer version, I guess, of what I'm telling you and said, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not really happy with the course of how things are going with this new business, but it's only been less than a year. Can I really rebrand the whole thing and change it? Mm -hmm. And overwhelmingly, everybody said yes. And where do we sign up? So when you say, Ooh. how did you get your first clients? When I rebranded the business, my first clients actually came out of that mastermind. Oh, um, isn't that interesting. So the people so, closest to you who understood yes. what you were doing. So they nice. understood the concept. They had gotten yeah. to know me for about a year and felt that, you know, I had valuable skills in that area mm -hmm. as far as helping people build their social media and their network and you know their relationships essentially to help grow their personal and professional life so thankfully yeah. a few of them took a chance on me and you know very it's worked out so, so, so it was a <laughs> sounds like it was a combination of your own self not feeling satisfied with what was going on plus you weren't getting the response in the market Exactly. And I imagine yeah. one fed on the other because, you know, if you're not get, getting your whole energy into it, the market's not going to respond back to you. <laughs> right. Right. I think people yeah. were getting my energy. You know, yes. I think I was right. building a big network. I was building great relationships, but it wasn't focused in the right area, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so now what is your ideal client and how do you figure that out? So I think my ideal client right now, I'm really much more focused on the speaking and I do less mm -hmm. of the consulting. Right. Um, so I think people that need to build a book of business. So some okay. of the markets that I cover, you know, it's a wide range, but some of the niches are attorneys, um, right. financial advisors, mm -hmm. realtors, um, people in the pharmaceutical industry, okay. and of course, people with nonprofits. Sure. Um, and it may seem like nonprofits wouldn't fit that mold, but no, you know, as but, you know, yeah. um, it's really important for people in nonprofits to build relationships oh, yeah. and be able to fundraise and build their network and mm -hmm. spread the word of their mission and all of that. So um, yeah. that's been a great market for me. Well, and I can yeah. see a lot of executive directors really needing this kind of help because they are often the the only marketing voice, the only fundraising voice of their organization. Yes. And uh, being able to do this much more efficiently would make a huge difference. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, they're not only short staffed a lot of nonprofits, but a lot of times they have people that are very uh, program and mission driven right. and not so much people that are um, the type that really want to go out to networking events and put themselves out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some of it's teaching people how to do that in a way they're comfortable with. You yeah. Know? Well, it's not even <laughs> that they, they, uh, it's, it's they, they run away from this. Right. Stuff. <laughs> right. I didn't want to put it that way. No, yeah. no, no. no. Yeah. I mean, let's just be plain yeah. here. I mean, you know, somebody who maybe uh, was the best environmentalist, the best social worker, the best artist, whatever it is, isn't the person who, uh, I mean, even, and they might find themselves as an executive director, can really use what you're bringing to the table on. Yes. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. So, um, uh, now, I, I should... I should know the answer to this. You're, I hope I have the answer to this question here, which is what's the best way to find clients? Yeah, so the, obviously I'm going to say the best way to find clients is to network. I mean, exactly. my, my business has really grown on itself. So, mm -hmm. I mean, as far as the clientele I've had for consulting, word of mouth has been tremendously, you know, successful for me. And right. then now giving all of the talks and workshops, um, I'm at a point now where I will definitely get clients out of each talk, whether that's individual clients or people okay. recommending me for other talks or workshops to companies and firms and conferences. So right. um, it's great because, you know, I feel like that's been super helpful. Um, you mentioned some of the writing I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that has also been super helpful. I think people looking at ways that they can gain visibility without spending a whole bunch of money. Obviously, things sure. take time and time is money. Yeah. But, you know, uh, writing for something like the Huffington Post or Philadelphia mm -hmm. Magazine, uh, th those have really 
increased my visibility in the community and I've had people contact me who said I've read you know your oh, article good. in this magazine and we were looking for a speaker and that sort of thing so well, and one of the yeah. things I mean I find that there are some efficiencies you can get out of uh, like text speech programs if somebody feels like they they're not a writer just right. blather it out on the page yeah. <laughs> through dragon or something and then edit it go back and look at it and that that might be enough to get them started yeah uh, I would that. not consider myself a writer I mean I have mm -hmm. two younger sisters and my youngest sister she's the writer of the family she's mm. the one who should write the novel okay. um, I just give tips you know yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. well that's good yeah that, that, that's good so so you don't have to be uh, you know the dark it was a dark and stormy night no I am not that person <laughs> I mean I love that but I'm not that person right yeah, yeah. okay cool cool um, so were there was there a time when well obviously there was at a point uh, my question is was there a time when you were about to give up on it all but it sounded like there was a time when when you looked to turn um, if you hadn't made that turn what do you think you would have done that's a good question um, I think I probably would have given it about another six months to a year and then given up on it. Okay. Um, you know, if it was going in the same direction. Right. I think if right. I hadn't kind of found my ground, you know, mm -hmm. as far as what I really was more passionate about, I wouldn't have really continued with it. I don't think I would have gone back to the legal world. Um, right. So right. again, I'm not sure I would have had a game plan once again <laughs> at that point. But no, I don't think I would. I don't think I would have continued with it indefinitely if it wasn't going down mm. the path that I hoped. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Life well, is too short, as well, I figured it, it, out. So. Exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and as I say, the, uh, um, the the wound marks from beating your head against the wall during that have, have healed nicely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, what's the most important thing that somebody should know as they're starting out in, uh, in consulting the nonprofits? Well, what's the thing that really uh, grabs you? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing I've noticed is um, even though there's uh, people like us in this field and this mm. is the job, you know, this, this is how we pay our bills. Right. There's a lot of nonprofits that just feel like, you know, we have such a great mission. We don't have the resources. Can't you just do this for us? Yes. And you yeah. really have to overcome that because mm. this is your job. So, yeah. you know, I've definitely had situations where uh, nonprofits have hired me and I've said, this is the rate that I usually would charge for this. And they said, I'm sorry, our budget is X and it's lower. Mm. And then it's for me to decide you know do I want to do it for the lower rate which usually I will you mm -hmm. know um, or do I not want to um, okay. but I think it's important to you know not fall on that idea of it's a nonprofit and I want to help them and they don't have the resources because you still have to pay your electric it's, and you were yeah Pico and doesn't that. take that right <laughs> <laughs> the electric, yeah. the electric utility so that's definitely that. something yeah. I would say and then as a broader perspective just as an entrepreneur not so much with the nonprofit consulting mm -hmm. I think one thing that has really helped me is hiring a virtual assistant and and if oh. you know if you have if okay. you I know people who are friends who are entrepreneurs and it makes more sense to have an actual in-person assistant depending right. on their job but sure. the virtual assistant has worked well for me it's not been a huge financial burden as mm. a solopreneur you know to have that and there's tasks that I'm able to give her that are much better delegated than me spending an entire day on so, so let's um, get into this a little more yeah. Maybe explain what is a virtual assistant and how it how you guys interact that's yeah, so I mean, you know, we we have phone meetings. Mm -hmm. We interact through email. Um, okay. I guess if I wanted to do Skype or something like that, I could. But she's in another part of the country. Okay. And you know, I pay her a monthly fee for right. a certain amount of hours, and then I basically have a um, task scheduler, hmm. and I schedule tasks, and I give her due dates, and then I email all the details, and she takes care of it, and okay. then she emails me when it's completed. Now, so, how did you find this person? I actually found her. I'm trying to think uh, through another entrepreneur friend. Oh, okay. I wanted to get a virtual assistant. And I just started asking around mm -hmm. um, because I think that's the best way. People that yeah. are already using somebody that they trust and find successful. Unless they want to protect that person right. and not give them the <laughs> Right, hours right. Well, yeah, most, right. most people work with more than one person. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. So I remember I interviewed three or four people, and mm -hmm. this was the person that I decided to go to go right. with. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So it's been helpful. I mean, I think there's nothing that she does for me I couldn't do myself. Right. But, um, you know, it might take her an hour and take me six hours. And it will cost you much less for her to do it. Exactly. And it would basically billable time on your calendar exactly yeah so yeah. it's worked out great oh, that's, yeah that's really yeah. cool so um, any particular issues uh, infrastructure issues that you've run into that uh, people ought to you know have be, be alerted to Infrastructure uh, issues, I mean, like I said, I think it took me longer than it should have to learn to delegate, and I think okay. it's, it's still a process. And this is through uh, yeah, your virtual for, assistant? Through my virtual assistant. I think, right. um, you know, there are, there's more that I could give her, that mm. I could get off my plate, but I think 
some of us have a harder time giving up control than others, and I am one of those people. Well, and that's the other side of the be <laughs> being the entrepreneur sword, right? right? Yeah. Right. Okay, so, so yeah, I think that's been a big thing. I mean, clearly, you know, I don't try to do books and things like that myself. I have a good accountant. Mm -hmm. I'm not a numbers person. So okay. I think you have to know what your strengths are. Um, you know, I've been to a number of seminars, and instead of realizing that you need to get better at the things you're not good at, it's it's really what I've learned the opposite. You need to outsource what you're not good at and focus on your core competencies. Right. right. So I'm not a numbers person. Somebody else has to deal with the numbers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For me, that would be events. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, it's different for everyone. That, that's yeah. where, you know, um, I'm back. yeah, I, I certainly get that. So um, what to you is the difference between nonprofit culture and for-profit culture? How did you treat the clients differently? Is there a way of... I don't treat the clients differently um, okay. because to me, I think nonprofits should operate more like businesses. Okay. Um, I think sure. nonprofits, you know, some realize that, and I think some feel that they are totally separate mm -hmm. as far as you know how they should operate from a business. But I think. Um, more nonprofits would benefit from understanding that they should focus more on the way a business runs. And sure. especially things like, you know, the fundraising and the relationship building and um, how they're able to spread their mission and the word of what they do on social media and mm -hmm. in the press and things like that. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, you can't ignore that stuff, even though the mission and the programming is very important. Um, right. If you ignore that stuff, what's going to happen is you know you won't raise the money you need to raise. You won't have volunteers that are consistent, yep. um, not only for your events but for your organization. You won't have the next generation of leaders. So I think a lot of nonprofits, especially smaller ones, are lacking having that young professional base mm. um, because you know they're not focused on them. They're focused on the bigger donors because young okay. professionals don't have the money. Right. But they're the ones who are going to be the next generation of supporting your organization and even yeah. running your organization. So all of that stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> having uh, having a more uh, business tact is good for uh, I think having more of a strategy I right. think you know having more of a strategy for how you're gonna do this you know sometimes you know when I first started the first business and I was mm -hmm. more focused on events you know sometimes I'd be sitting with nonprofits who say you know we just started and what we want to do is plan a big annual fundraiser mm. I said that's great who's gonna come you yeah, know right um, so you know you really have to think about that stuff yeah. you, do you have a base of people mm -hmm. um, you know is it worth expending all this money? Like, is it actually going to bring you in what you're looking for? And what are you looking for? What yeah. are your goals? If nobody shows up to the right. event, does it count? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, you really need to look at things like that, um, especially if you're a smaller nonprofit and you don't mm -hmm. have the budget, you know, for something, you know, bigger. Or if you just, you know, haven't been around that long yeah. and don't have the following. And Now, you know. it sounds, I mean, but the same can be applied to consulting businesses. If nobody, right. if you have no clients, do you have a business? Right. right. <laughs> and so being able to generate that kind of activity uh, is it, and it's different I mean than doing the thing you know it, it's the other stuff around it yeah and I think you know one thing also that I'll mention um, it works for businesses and for nonprofits mm -hmm. what I try to really focus on with people is what separates you from somebody else so ah. for example you know if there's if you go to a networking event and there are seven realtors in the room, why should somebody work with you? Sure. What do you bring to the table that's different than those other six realtors? And that goes the same for nonprofits because you have tons of worthwhile organizations oh, yeah. and a lot of them doing the same thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, why are people going to give to one small nonprofit that supports right. pediatric cancer as opposed to another one? You know, why are you going to be able to get the word out better? Why are people going to gravitate to your nonprofit more? And it could um, be the, a lot of the same thing. Like it could be you're in a different geographic area. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything super unique or huge it just means that you are different in being able to identify that to people right to say that this is your your thing your specialty area right exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah it doesn't have to be rocket science but you do have to figure out what it is sure. it distinguishes you yeah so um uh, is there anything else that uh, you'd like people to know about uh, doing business with nonprofits as an entrepreneur as a uh, person who interacts with them I think you know the best advice I can give, whether it's for a nonprofit or a for-profit, try to connect or reconnect with somebody every day. Mm. Um, if you can take a few minutes and yep. connect with somebody, whether that's a short call or just an email, you know, maybe you remembered, like, you know, for example, today there was a friend of mine I realized I hadn't reached out to for a while, and he's been going through some bad personal stuff. Oh, sure. So I just sent him a message: How are yeah. things going? Right. You know, I haven't heard from you for about a month. Right. Um, and I think that kind of thing is so important. And just people always talk about, well, I have the first contact, I sent the first email, but how do I build or maintain the relationship? And I think it's just those little touch points um, that don't take a lot of time, but are really 
meaningful to people in having that likability and trust and really wanting to continue a relationship with you. So so just to drill down, this is good, this is just to drill down a little bit on this. So um, are we talking about Facebook, LinkedIn, email, uh, you know, HandNote, how, how do you? All of it, I okay. mean, it's really up to you, you know? Right. Um, and I think uh, there are some people that gener you know, that will warrant one method as opposed to another. Ooh. And heaven you know? forbid phone call. Right, no, I think phone, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I have to say, you know, as somebody that does networking, this is probably not a great statement, but I used to like the phone a lot more. Yeah. And now my days are so packed that mm. it's like a lot easier to respond to people by email than to right. try to return calls in between, you know, sure. meetings and events and all of that. But no, I mean, I think you can pick a select group of people where the handwritten note and the phone call is warranted. Right. And that's sort of a first tier of people that you're close to or you want to build relationships with. And then, you know, everybody else, it's fine, you know, to go the social media method and email, LinkedIn and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the reaching out, I think, is really important. Yeah. That's that's great. Well, uh, this has really been helpful. I think uh, you, you covered some tremendous points in just being able to be your own business person and an entrepreneur and, and how to actually get out and connect with people. I mean, this, is, uh, this has been really good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Today, um, uh, we've had Jennifer Lynn Robinson. Of, uh, she's the founder and CEO of Purposeful Networking. And this has been Backstage Pass with Think NP. Now get to work. <laughs>